So, here we are, uh, first time streaming with Streamlabs. No idea how this is going to go. Uh, I should be in the live chat. Let me see if that's actually the case. So, we should be good, I think. Yeah, we should be good. Awesome. So, I am live. I haven't been live in a while. <laughs> uh, I always get like quite flustered with live streams and often everything goes wrong. So, that's why I have decided to start using Streamlabs. And uh, yeah, we'll see how this goes. If you subscribe, there will be like a thing in the alert box, as it's called, and then people can see that you have subscribed to the channel. And if you leave a super chat, same thing, people can see that you have left a super chat. And if you click on the very first link in the description down below, or in the description of this live stream, then you can leave me a donation that goes straight to my Patreon. The link looks very suspicious, but honestly, it's real. It's a real link. It's a link that's created by Streamlabs, and they are like the people that make sure that the donation you give to me goes straight to my PayPal. Whatever. It's all new. We're gonna, you know, um, see how all of this goes. <laughs> So yeah, hi, happy to see you all here. I did not expect many people. Um, today I wanted to look at some new archeological discoveries that were made in the past month, back in January of 2024. And I've decided to probably do one of these live streams to go over new discoveries of the past month that I haven't covered on the channel uh, in a live stream so that we can still talk about the latest discoveries without me having to make dedicated videos on it because, you know, sometimes I just can't. <laughs> Things happen, just like me getting COVID and being sick for like two and a half weeks. Why? <laughs> that ruined my entire January and my entire upload schedule and now I, I'm even more behind on my Neanderthal documentary. So yeah, you're all gonna hate me and I'm sorry. Don't hate me, don't hate me. Just, you know, I am late and I'm not that great. Thanks. So yeah, uh, I think I can do this. So I have a window capture ready. I sh at least I should have one ready. And no, no, it, it did not work. Let's uh, see. Uh, window capture. I want a chrome tab. Yes, this one. Yes, this one. Look! I can almost do this. Guys, I can almost stream like a normal person that doesn't mess it up constantly. Like, uh, one, one question. Is the audio too loud or is it good? That's, that's the one thing I need to know at this point. Oh my god, thank you, Gary! Wow! How can I, can I highlight this or something? Like, how does this work? How does this work? Is there a highlight? There's a test widget. I did a widget. How many, are we slow? Did I not have, oh, I did not have a highlight here. Why am I like this? Why? Huh? 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 Let's see, we're gonna add this event list and it's gonna go right here. We'll see. And how can I, can I just, no, it doesn't work like that. <gasps> yeah, it does work. Oh my God, it's just very slow. Okay, good to know. Oh my God. Audio is great, audio is fine. <gasps> my audio is fine in the live stream, guys. Am I, my, my camera's working because I got that new webcam. So, um, everything's working. What the hell? One day I'm, I'm getting professional one day, you know? One day. Someday I'll be professional. Someday. So yeah, okay. <laughs> we have this here. So I just wanted to give a quick look to this amazing discovery in County Kerry of Ireland. 
And I think we need to take a look at this because it's amazing. Yeah, I am a pro streamer for the first time. I'm actually not having like a completely effed up live stream in which like either the video or the audio doesn't work. I'm so happy. I'm so pleased with myself right now. Like, oh, happy, happy, happy. Okay. Uh, you can like super chats and also open it for likes by us. Wait, well, how does that work? Oh my God. One, one day I'll get to that point of like being actually good at this. But for now, I'm afraid that we're going to have to do it like this. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's, yeah, doesn't mean, doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Look, yeah, nice nails. I know. Like, wait, do you know? Yeah, sort of. Sort of. You can almost see it. There's like a gradient in them. It's very nice. I love my nails. Yeah. Okay. Streamer, what video game is this? This is just me blabbing. Like I usually do. Only this time we're actually going to look at some archaeological discoveries of the past month. A we're getting somewhere, guys. All right. So let's go over this lost 4,000 year old tomb that was rediscovered in County Kerry. So a lost 4,000 year old tomb has been rediscovered on the Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry. The megalithic tomb known locally as Altor Nagrang, the Sun Altar, was believed to have been completely destroyed in the 1840s with its stone broken and carried away for use as building materials. But as you can see, there are stones there in that video picture thing. Nice. So while the existence of a tomb near Bailey on Farterach was documented in the 19th century antiquarian literature, a record of the monument's location did not exist. Bad, 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 bad archaeologists always leave us a location. We need it. An 1838 sketch of the tomb, its reputed association with the sun and its strange disappearance has been a source of intrigue for archaeologists for decades. However, the 180 year old mystery has now been solved by local man Billy Machfloin. He's amazing. Applause for him. The folklorist had not only found the prehistoric site, but he has also discovered some of the large stones, which had been believed to have been removed still in situ. And that's always really important because that means that it wasn't completely destroyed and it wasn't, you know, out of the blue gone. It was still there. It was just lost to us, which is really cool. Nice. I love it. Um, let's continue. So a number of orthostats, which are the large upright stones, I've mentioned them way back when I still made videos on ancient monuments, which I probably will do again in the future, but I don't do it as of now, but a number of orthostats have survived as well as a large capstone. With capstones, really cool, because you know, um, I've stood underneath a capstone um, on one of the um, dolmens in the Netherlands, and that wasn't even like a massive capstone, but you know, being beneath it and looking up above at it. Yeah, I could have been crushed in like half a second if it fell on me and I would have died for sure. So large capstones, I'm fascinated by them and I would not want to be underneath them if possible. <laughs> but yeah, more maybe under the dense undergrowth. Uh, so yeah, it's really cool. The monument is situated on the crest of a hill overlooking the village of Anbauten. I'm not great at Irish pronunciations, uh, the Celtic pronunciations, really, it's extremely difficult, even though my name <laughs> is Irish. <laughs> Please don't come for me in the comments. Please, chat. <laughs> don't come for me. But yeah, no. Um, <laughs> it's really cool that this tomb was rediscovered. So the only known visual representation of the intact monument was captured in a sketch by Lady Chatterton, 
an English woman who visited West Kerry in 1838. Go women! Like, go you, Miss Chatterton! In her travel journal, Miss Chatterton describes climbing the mountain in the company of an elderly priest to find a curious piece of antiquity, once an altar supposed to have been used for offering sacrifices to the sun. However, when the antiquarian Richard Hitchcock came to West Kerry to inspect the tomb in 1852, he found the monument no longer existed. The stones which composed it having been broken and carried away for building purposes, as if there were no others in the neighborhood. Like, why, why would we ruin a perfectly nice ancient tomb to use those stones as building materials for other things? Like, people, people, come on, people. No, we, we don't do that. We don't ruin ancient monuments to create something new. Then we use different stones. We leave the ancient monuments as is. Duh. <sighs> Thankfully, in 2024, I think I don't need to tell this to anyone. <laughs> At least I hope. Let's just, you know, preserve all the ancient monuments we have in the world. We need them. You know, we, we need them. We need them to learn more about our history. So, okay, back, back at it. Uh, Mr. McFloyne had long been fascinated by Mrs. Chatterton's sketch, and I have no idea how to pronounce this. Alterna Grelin. Irish people, please don't kill me for saying it that badly, for butchering it. I'm so sorry. My deepest, sincerest apologies. Uh, but yeah, that association with the sun in local folklore, and he said about searching for the lost tomb on the slopes of Cruach Martin. Some, something like that. So, yeah, something like that. I, I don't, I'd really, oh my god. The Irish Celtic pronunciation, like this is something that I've wanted to learn for as long as I can remember. I've wanted to be able to speak Gaelic for such a long time. Gaelic is so extremely difficult. So please, 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 don't, don't. Don't attack me for this. No, but like, honestly, I respect people who are able to speak Gaelic or Gaelic. There is a difference. You have Gaelic and you have Gaelic, which is awesome, but they are different and not the same. One is spoken in Ireland, which is Gaelic, and then you have Gaelic, which is spoken in Scotland. A little bit similar, but still different. Different languages. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's another history lesson that we just got here from me. I don't know where that came from, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, back to the thing. You, I mean, you, you, all you guys can keep reading. I just want to, you know, read as though um, you, you can't read the screen. I knew that there was a lost site of Alternagrain on the hill somewhere, so I started to walk the hill in search of it, covering a large area. Eventually, these stones caught my eye, he said. Then when I took a closer look, I saw that the features on one of the stones perfectly matched an orthostat in the sketch from 1838. The monument appears to be a wedge tomb, which dates to the early Bronze Age between 2500 BC and 2000 BC which for me is BCE, but that's fine. This is not an official scientific article, so they use BC instead of BCE. It's fine. Which tombs are the most numerous megalithic burial structures found on the Dingle Peninsula? Also, I just want to say for all the people from Ireland, Dingle Peninsula, that's just chef's kiss. Somehow, I don't know why, but somehow I just want to go there and just be like, I'm on the Dingle Peninsula. It just sounds funny to me. Like, honestly, Dingle Peninsula sounds super funny to me. So I just want to go there for the fact that I can say that I've been to like a funny sounding place. I'm childish, like, I'm, I'm very childish like this, so please let me. <laughs> 
So these uh, wedge tombs are usually positioned on high ground, but not the highest point. There's often certain alignments associated with them. Quite often the opening tends to look towards the west or the south or the southwest, which means the setting sun or the highest point of the sun. Uh, these are very important things for ancient people because that was a way to also track the day, but also the setting sun means the end of life. So some tombs were positioned towards the west, towards the setting sun, because their life had ended. So it's that ritualistic aspect of a burial tomb. I'm very well versed in burial tombs. This used to be my specialty before human evolution sort of became my specialty. But, you know, honestly, I will never actually let go of the experience and the knowledge that I have on the burial mounds and the megalithic monuments and why they were built in a certain way, the ritualistic aspects with them. So like I said, I'll probably create more videos on ancient monuments in the future as well. Like I still haven't covered the Ring of Brodgar in Scotland. I need to burp. Why do I need to burp on a live stream? I mean, I burp in my games when I game with friends and my burps are very loud, so... I, I did an inside burp. No one here heard it. It's, it's fine. It's, it's fine, people. It's fine. But, um, yeah, no, like I said, um, I never created the video on the Ring of Brodgar and the Ness of Brodgar, which is this settlement right next to it. <laughs> uh, but these are just fascinating monuments to me personally. But back when I still made these ancient structures videos, I saw that there was less demand for them. And since I've started creating human evolution videos, I've seen that there's a lot of demand for human evolution. And I'm wondering how much demand there is for ancient structures. So I have covered the stones of Stenes, and I'm very proud of myself that I did. I've also covered um, Scarabre, I've covered the Standing Stones of Kalanish, I've covered Newgrange, Noth, I've covered Carrowkeel Megalithic Cemetery, Carrow Morse Megalithic Cemetery from Ireland. Uh, so yeah, I've covered things, but... I'm just wondering if anyone would like to see a video on the Ring of Broadcar, let me know, you know, uh, in the chat or uh, message me on social media, like send me a tweet or a thread or a message on Blue Sky comment, whatever. Do that. So yeah, um, let's continue reading this article because otherwise we will be here for the foreseeable future, like three hours plus. And usually I live stream for about two hours, so that's fine. Um, so usually you will find cremated remains of people inside wedge tombs. Like I said, they're burial mounds, burial tombs. Uh, all these things were created to lay people to rest. So of course you will find remains inside, but usually these remains were either cremated or they were just buried. So back in the time that this tomb was created, around two and a half, I, I can't speak, like I'm very Dutch. I uh, still have some fatigue from COVID, but that's fine. Um, around the time of this burial uh, tomb, 2500 BCE, which means it's like four and a half thousand years old, um, the people that used to be laid to rest were cremated at that time. There weren't many normal burials without cremation. Uh, it has a name. I completely am flunking on the name. Uh, what's it called when someone is just buried and not cremated? Uh, no, it's not this what I'm looking for. That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, it has a, it's a different, natural burial, Not also not what I'm going for. Nope, 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 uh, nope, inhumation, thank you. 
So you have cremation and you have inhumation. Inhumation means that you just buried the person. And cremation is that you burnt them and then you may have buried them. So yeah, uh, inhumation was the word I was going for. Like, ah, this is fun. My brain is still not completely functioning. So thank you, COVID, for that. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> More than a month after contracting it, I'm still being messed by COVID. But it's fine. It's inhumation. I just, you know. So usually you will find cremated remains of people inside and not inhumation remains. Um, they, were, they probably represent the burial place of a significant family or community group. But they could have been used for other things as well. Sometimes they were used for ceremonies and rituals. But then you have to look at the positioning and how it's aligned to the stars and other astronomical significance uh, and stuff like that. Um, we have Carol Moore and Carol Keel megalithic cemeteries that face towards the east, towards the rising sun. Completely different reason for building them towards the rising sun instead of the setting sun. And then you have all, uh, things like in the fall equinox or like the autumn equinox around September, you have these tombs that do indeed face east with their opening, but they are placed to the east because around the autumn equinox in September, the moon will rise. And the rising moon at that point in time will shine a light into that opening upon the burial chamber. I think it was in Carol Keel that they had this. And I think there was one in Carol Moore, but I'm not completely sure on this. But yeah, um, so they placed it in a certain way towards the rising moon or setting moon or highest point of the moon so that the moon could light up their ancestors. So it's these astronomical alignments, whether they face east, south or west, all have different reasons. And they were built because they wanted to shine a certain light on their ancestors, whether that was moonlight on the spring equinox or moonlight on the fall equinox or sunlight on the uh, winter uh, solstice or sunlight on the sun like this is the summer solstice, all things like this. It's very important for them, for the ancient people it was at least. Uh, Newgrange uh, is aligned with the winter solstice sunrise and um, that sunrise comes all the way through the passage into that inner chamber and that passage is 19 meters long. That's really long. So it's just perfect craftsmanship and I mean, honestly, megalithic people were incredible and the megalithic monument builders were the best, honestly. So yeah, uh, also I can see that my webcam has done something weird. So yeah, no, I, I didn't want you to, don't track me. I didn't ask you to track me, bad boy. So yeah, this webcam has a live tracking feature so that if I were to be more walking around and things like that, then the webcam can just follow me through the room, which honestly isn't the best feature when I'm just sitting down. Would make y'all y'all nauseated. Not fun. So um, let's see. An archeologist from the National Monument Service has recently inspected the site and confirmed the nature of the find. The tomb will now be added to the database of national monuments. The significance of the rediscovery of the wedge tomb is to bring it back to back into the archaeological record so that the archaeological community can study it. Um, for the first time in over 180 years, archaeologists know where the tomb is situated and it will enhance our understanding of wedge tomb distribution. So yeah, this, this find, going back to the top where we can see the stones like in place. This to me is an amazing find. Uh, I love Irish tombs. They're really, really beautiful and they're wonderfully constructed. 
really, really cool. So yeah, this was the first uh, thing I wanted to talk about. So yeah, uh, we can close this one. Nice. We closed the first one, guys. We're getting somewhere. Oh, this is a lot of, lot of... Can we just... Yes, the much better. I like my screen to be like empty as much as possible. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Did, did, did fun things happen in the chat or not? I, I see Sop with Camel Toe says... Uh, technically, we are still in an ice age, just a very long stable cycle. Our weather stability is actually unusually stable and not the norm over the last 20,000 years. Actually, you're right. Yeah, we are in an ice age. We're just in a warmer climatic period of said ice age. Ice ages just are continuous and they have warm and colder climatic periods. And we're currently in a warm period and we have been since the end of the Younger Dryas, kind of. There was a very, very, very super tiny short ice age afterwards, but we don't really talk about that. It's not very important at this point in time, I think, because uh, we're just gonna do this. App blockers, I know I should probably install some app blockers one day. They're very annoying, those ads, but at the same time, I make a living off of ads, so somehow it feels kind of wrong. <laughs> Like, I'm being a cheat if I use an ad blocker while at the same time using ads to make a living. <laughs> Can I be that hypocritical? <laughs> I probably can't, but should I? That's probably the question. All right, so, um, let's, let's continue. We have another, another, New discovery! Amazing! Yeah, it's called an interglacial period. Thank you, Robert Bench. I am very, very blonde. <laughs> and because of COVID, I have issues with um, remembering names and words, especially English words. <laughs> yeah, since I'm very Dutch. Um, also, um, <clears throat> Can I say something in Dutch to all y'all? I want to say hello, uh, good evening. So, uh, hello, goedavond. That was me saying something in Dutch. Enjoy that. So yeah, um, let's continue. East Africa's oldest modern human fossil is way older than previously thought. This means that this is not the oldest modern human fossil ever found. That is still in Jebel Irut in Morocco. But this is the oldest modern human fossil found in East Africa, which is like, if you know where Morocco is, uh, we, can, we can do this. Morocco on the map, like here. So here we have Morocco, really cool country. And somewhere in the mountainous area of Jebeli Root, I don't know exactly on the map where that is, but please forgive me for that. But yeah, this is where the oldest modern human fossil has been found. Fossils, I should say, because there are more than one. Uh, they are 300,000 years old and they are our oldest direct ancestors because they were homo sapiens, which is really cool. And this one in Omo 1, I think is Ethiopia from, yeah, southwestern Ethiopia. So from Morocco all the way down southwest to Ethiopia, which means that, oh, and all these names, I'm sorry, are in Dutch. Like I said, I am very Dutch. So sorry. But yeah, um, <laughs> which means that my Google Maps and all that stuff will be in Dutch as well. Yay! <laughs> but yeah, so all the way from here, I don't... Do, can you guys see my cursor or not? Like, I don't see my cursor. I should be able to see my cursor. Let me see. Capture cursor. Oh, oh. Cancel. Cancel. I messed up. I messed up. I messed up, guys. I, I messed up. 
Because I closed the tab. Why do I close that tab? Okay, I cannot close Chrome tabs. But if I do this or this, I don't see my, I don't see my cursor. It's fine. Okay, it's fine. There's just no cursor on the screen. That's whatever. So here in Morocco, if you can see on screen where Morocco is in Dutch, uh, this is where the oldest Homo sapiens fossils ever discovered have been found, 300,000 years old. And then we have Ethiopia, uh, which is spelled as Ethiopia in Dutch, um, <laughs> to the southwest, where the uh, Homo 1 fossils of Homo sapiens have been found. And this is really, really, really amazing because they are 36,000 years older than previously thought. And that has to do with uh, a volcanic eruption that messed up the timeline that we currently knew. So yeah, uh, let's go and read this article. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry for all the ads. I, I, I always have ads everywhere. I should probably one day install an ad blocker. So at a remote region in southwestern Ethiopia, the Omo River and its long vanished tributaries have laid bare rugged bluffs and hillsides, exposing a layer cake of ancient sediments and the trapped remains of early humans. Before the COVID pandemic, Celine Vidal and colleagues journeyed to the site known as the Kabish Formation to work in scorching temperatures up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, picking through the ashes of ancient volcanic eruptions to learn more about some of the oldest members of our species. And um, yeah, 110 degrees Fahrenheit, I've experienced it in Egypt, it's extremely difficult. Like really, it's, um, it's rough. <laughs> so all the respect to them for working like that. And this is what I mean when I say we should respect and honor the archeologists working in the field because they are dedicating their lives to their research. And people like Graham Hancock shitting on them, yeah, that makes me really angry. And I'm not an academic in any way, shape or form. I didn't even finish high school and I'm fine with that. Things happened in my life and I am currently where I am and I worked hard to get to where I am, but I do not have any degree whatsoever. I didn't finish high school. I don't have a diploma. I have my subscriber button for 100,000 subscribers from YouTube. And that's all I have. And I'm proud of it because I worked hard. So yeah, but these archeologists worked their butts off and they definitely deserve much, much, much more respect and recognition for their hard work. So yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> it was an adventure, says Fidal and Volcan a volcanologist, wow, that's a name, uh, a volcanologist at the University of Cambridge who studies how ancient eruptions impacted climate and civilizations. This is the part of science that online life isn't ever going to replace, which I absolutely love and I have to agree with her. Her, him, her, him, hmm. I don't know yet if it's it, Celine Vidal, her, her, okay. Just wanted to make sure that I don't say him or her to them. You know, I tried to do the gender thing correctly, like we all do. One of the reasons Vidal and colleagues came to the site was to learn about Homo 1, one of the oldest known examples of Homo sapiens. Like I said, one of the oldest known and not the oldest because the oldest known samples are at Jebel Root in Morocco. But this is the oldest known sample in East Africa, which is also very important to note. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm talking so much that I need more drinks. And it's just crystal clear peach. It's just a sparkly water with a peachy flavor. That's all. I don't drink alcohol much. Um, Using geochemical clues to match the layer of volcanic ash blanketing the fossil to a specific volcanic eruption, they discovered that Omo 1 is 36,000 years older than previously believed. Ash from an enormous eruption of the Ethiopian Rift Shala volcano was put down atop the sediment later, 
Mup, was put down atop the sediment layer containing the Oma 1 fossil approximately 233,000 years ago, which means that Oma 1 and her kind lived here at least that long ago. So that means that within 70,000 years after emerging as a species at Jebel Irut in Morocco, the Homo sapien species, our ancestors, made their way to East Africa, which is really cool. Each eruption has a unique geochemical composition. This is a kind of fingerprint which we can use to try to figure out exactly which eruption on the Ethiopian rift would have created a layer of volcanic ash. This is the part of science that I absolutely love. We can use events from the past as like, they leave their fingerprints, so to speak, for us to identify. And therefore we can date things much, much, much more, um, yeah, um, Perfectly, for lack of a better term, because my COVID brain is really not letting me do my thing. Don't get COVID! Really. Can't say that enough. Like, don't get COVID. This is just fog inside my head. It's just fog. <laughs> it's not fun. I hate this foggy brain. But yeah. <clears throat> We found a match for the ash layer that covers the fossils, so we know which eruption produced that ash and the age of that eruption. The findings were published uh, back then in the Journal of Nature, because uh, honestly, when did, was this published? When was this? January 12th! So, in the week of January 12th, was it, it was published in the Journal of Nature that showed that Oma 1 had to be older than the layer that later fell from the sky to rest atop her remains. I mean, pretty obvious, of course, but yeah, they do not, however, reveal her maximum age. We only know the minimum. We only know that it's at least 233,000 years old, but it could be much older. We don't know for sure at this point in time. We know that it's at least this old. Um, it may later be possible to determine the oldest possible date for OMA-1 if the team can similarly identify another volcanic layer from below the fossil. Because then we know an estimate between this is the oldest possible date and this is the youngest possible date. Currently we only know the youngest possible date because we don't know what's underneath. Which is still, honestly, really cool. You can see here that this is like the eruption of the Shala. This is like how they determine things. It's really cool. Famed paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey and colleagues found Oma 1 near the southern Epi no, near the southern Ethiopian town of Kibish in 1967. Originally, scientists dated freshwater mollusk shells to that were found with a skull to conclude that the remains were about 130,000 years old. Back then, that was the only way they knew how to date it. They also saw from the beginning quite clearly that the skull's flat face, prominent chin and high forehead were distinctly modern, and that this ancient person should be classified as a member of her own species. For more than half a century, the fossil had been known as one of the oldest existing Homo sapien skulls anywhere in the world. The partial skull and skeleton were considered the oldest until the 2017 discovery of 300,000-year-old skull, jaw, and tooth fragments from Jebel Irut in Morocco. So, yeah. In 2005, on the Omo 1 skull, a radioactive dating study pushed back the age of the fossil skulls significantly to at least 195,000 years ago, but today's study now suggests that Omo 1 is actually tens of thousands of years older. The era in which Homo sapiens likely first appeared and gradually evolved in Africa between about 3,000 360,000, wow, I really cannot speak, people, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Between about 360,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago was one of 
cataclysmic volcanic activity. Enormous eruptions rocked the region, depositing thick layers of ash that would have made some localities uninhabitable. Because changing environments sometimes push early humans to adopt new behaviors and tools. These eruptions might have actually played a part in shaping evolution here. Perhaps they caused groups of ancient humans to move around, encountering one another and exchanging everything from genes to technologies before separating again. More certainly, the volcanic ash helped to create a record of what occurred during the turbulent era. At the Kabish formation, researchers were stumped by a massive layer of ash, more than six feet thick, just above the sediments where Oma 1 and other fossils were found, at a distance of nearly 200 miles away from the nearest ancient volcano. The ash was floor the ash was flower-like, so fine that it lacked enough large crystals to be used for radiometric dating, which is a shame, which provides an age by measuring how much of the mineral's radioactive potassium has decayed into radioactive argon. This material just wasn't suitable for the type of techniques we normally use, Vidal explains. But Vidal and colleagues were able to determine the age of the eruption that deposited the ash by sampling rocks closer to the, their volcanic sources in places where ashy debris contained plenty of large crystals suitable for radiometric dating. Really awesome. Like, they did a great job. So, yeah, indeed, the article is from January 12, 2022. 22? 2022? Did I just... Not 24. Oh my god. Wow. Wow, people. COVID brain. Like, get COVID. This is an article that's two years old. Oh, I'm doing so good today. Like, I'm not messing up my live stream with, like, my audio or my video. I'm just messing up my live stream with just an article that's two years old. Wow. Let me um, take that shame in stride. <laughs> Wonderful. I messed up. It is indeed a very... I was thinking, like, the funny thing about this is I've been reading this article and the only thing I've been thinking is that I was very familiar with this research because I have actually created a video on this particular research. Let me see if I can find the um, video. Oh my god, yeah. Yes, this is indeed very, very, very familiar for me. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. It's, yep, Homo sapiens fossils are older on my channel. Oh my gosh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I've actually created a video on this. So, I, I was like, this sounds all very familiar. Boom! <laughs> I actually created a video on it, and I'm reading about it like, I had no idea. This truly is COVID brain. Uh, all right, so um, I can share this video. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I'll share the video in the uh, chat for all y'all. Yep. There you go. That's the video. <laughs> yep. Uh, I guess I'm blonde. <laughs> I guess all y'all can now say for tr truly that Kaylee is extremely blonde. <laughs> Wow. So yeah, uh, click on the video link I just shared if you want to learn more about the article I just read that's like two years old. Okay. I don't think I've ever showed anyone how extremely blonde I am, as I just did now. Okay, finally, yay! <laughs> we can go to the next one. <laughs> it's so bad. Oh, it's so bad. It's terrible. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, oh, hey, I'm a bit too big for this. Mm, let me see if I can just... Yep. Not 
it looks better. So I'm small, but everything else is just still happy and good. All right. <laughs> All right. We did this and uh, that was a thing, but it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Let's continue to the next one. This one is indeed from January 19, 2024. It was published. Yep. It was indeed published. It's fine. Uh, how many human species have walked Earth? More than you may think. From Hobbit people to Homo erectus, the human family tree has some very odd characters. Here you can see Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens. And we Homo sapiens are awesome. But we aren't the only human species, which is really cool. If you know a little bit more about my work, you know that, you know, I talk a lot about different human species. She's vaguely familiar with all the content she's created. I've created more than 203 videos as of this point in time. And I've actually deleted, I think, two at this point. Which means I used to have more than 205 videos. And I've just filmed a video right before this live stream started. And uh, yeah, COVID brain really makes me forget about everything in life. So yeah, at least I remember my name. That's good. <laughs> okay, let's get into this. Um, <clears throat> How many human species have walked Earth? Article on I effing love science. IFL science. Uh, on top of Homo sapiens, at least eight other species of our genus have walked Earth. Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis, and Homo neanderthalensis, which are the Neanderthals. And we also know that Denisovans were a thing, and then we have a possibility of dragon man being a different species, Homo longi. So it's likely in the future that there will be more than that are currently recognized or unrecognized. Um, but like I said, that's not even mentioning Denisovans, which may be a distinct species or subspecies, plus the unknowable number of human species that may be out there yet to be discovered by science. Because we know that there are ghost species of Homo. We know that there are ghost homo species because we have found their traces in our DNA and we don't know their origins. So they must have come from a species that we currently not yet know of. Awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> not sure if they talk about this later on, but uh, yeah, homeowner lady hype. I'm still trying to find someone who wants to draw my perfect representation of a homeowner lady. <laughs> <laughs> so that I can put it on like a t-shirt or on a coaster or other fun things. But yeah, let's go. So all of these animals, yes, we are animals. Just because we are humans doesn't mean we aren't animals as well. <laughs> We're animals in the first place. So all of these animals, that includes us, belong to the genus Homo, which comes from the Latin name for human. Members of the Homo family are part of a group called hominins. Uh, this should not be confused with hominids. The latter refers to modern humans and the other re uh, refers to living great apes, such as chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. Members of the Homo genus are all closely related to modern humans, relatively speaking, belonging to the same genus as us, just, you know, as tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards belong to the genus of Panthera. All of them, except for Homo sapiens, have since fallen into extinction. But there were points where we inhabited a world shared by several human species. Our species even interbred with some of them, and it was far from a one-night stand. I love that last part, like it was far from a one-night stand. Oh, <laughs> so scandalous. So scandalous. Our uh, relations with the Neanderthals. <laughs> Oh yeah, Henrik, I will definitely hit you up because I need the homeowner lady merch one day, very soon. Because I've been talking about this for like, what, two years at this point? <laughs> it's time for homeowner lady merch. 
if you can talk as much as me and talk as fast as me, you need enough liquids. So I'm gonna pour myself out because I was almost empty and being almost empty on a live stream isn't really a good thing. So yeah, our ancestors boinked with Neanderthals and it wasn't just a one night stand. <laughs> Bear in mind that none of these species evolved directly from one another in a linear development. I've spoken about this often on my channel. The human evolutionary tree isn't really a tree with branches that just end. It's more like a river that forks out and sometimes forks back in. So that's really important to remember. Homo erectus didn't suddenly turn into Homo sapiens one day, like a Pokemon evolving. I really love how I effing love science creates these articles. Like, I love their style and I often use them as one of my sources because it's amazing. I love them. They really are great. So, let's continue. If only it were so simple. The human family tree is messy, deeply intertwined and complex, not to mention full of gaps due to fragmentary fossil record. It's like a mosaic. It's not a puzzle, it's like a mosaic. We do, however, know a lot about some of the Homo species that have wandered the planet for the past few million years. Homo habilis, the earliest known member of the genus, currently known as Homo habilis, but there are people that say that it should not be in the Homo genus, and there are people that say that it should be. So it's, um, I've covered Homo habilis on the channel. If you haven't seen that video, please check it out. You can just search history with Kaylee Homo habilis and nearly all other Homo species that you can think of, I have covered. So go search for it. Um, the earliest known member of the genus Homo is Homo habilis, which evolved over 2.4 million years ago. Fossils of this species have been discovered in present-day Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Africa, indicating they once lived across a significant portion of eastern and southern Africa. Homo habilis is a crucial character in the story of hominin evolution, as their brain was larger than other apes, marking a significant milestone in the development of complex behavior also known as the handyman. They were skilled makers of stone tools. Not the first creators of stone tools, because stone tools actually predate all human species. It predates the entire Homo genus, as stone tools date back to 3.3 million years ago and were first created by the genus of Australopithecines. Covered this in a video as well, the invention of stone tools. You can watch that video as well. <laughs> But yeah, they, uh, their stone tools consisted of napped flakes that could be used as blades. More researchers believe that Homo habilis was bipedal and walked upright, although it would have looked relatively ape-like by our standards. After this pioneering species arrived on the scene, human evolution accelerated for reasons that remain unclear. Really, I should create a time machine, not to travel back in time myself, because hello, have you met me? I'm scared to do that. I don't want to die and be killed by like ancient stuff and ancient people, ancient human species that look at me and think like, hey, she's easy to kill, <laughs> done. So no, I want to build a time machine <laughs> so I can send cameras and stuff back, you know, like film things from an aerial point of view and learn more about ancient species. Like, I don't want to intervene. I don't want the butterfly effect. You know what I mean? Just a camera that captures everything from an aerial point of view. So yeah, we have a new subscriber. Yay, thank you, Talas2111. I'm great. So next up. This is uh, Homo habilis, a depiction. <clears throat> then we have Homo fences. And Homo fences sometimes is put together with Homo habilis, which is why I have not yet created a video on Homo fences because there are people that believe that it's just Homo habilis. And there are people that believe that it's a different species. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not an academic, I'm not one to talk about 
things like that. So the first known remains of homodal fences were discovered in 1972 along Lake Turkana in East Rudolf, Kenya. The species lived between 2.4 and 1.8 million years ago, around the same time as Homo habilis in similar parts of Africa. Anatomically speaking, it was also it was also relatively similar to Homo habilis, although fossil evidence shows that the species had a notably bigger skull. So this, this similarity has led to debates among paleoanthropologists about the classification and evolutionary relationships of these early hominins. So that's why I just said it's unclear if it is like an actual separate species or if it's part of Homo habilis but because they lived in a different environment, they may have evolved slightly differently. We, we don't know. So yeah, that's a good question, but don't have an answer for that. <laughs> um, why not time viewers, where do you just see the past through goggles? Like something like that. Yeah, but you still need to like send a camera all the way back so we can actually view it, I think. So we can have filmed it. Something like that. My brain is like hurting when I'm trying to use it at this point. I really don't like COVID. It's fun. It's really not. Okay. No sending back large black monoliths. No, no, no. No sending back anything that could mess up with the timeline that has been so far. Like we cannot mess anything up. No butterfly effects, nothing. We cannot even touch a mosquito. You know what I mean? No mosquito touching. No, no, no touching. No touching, no touching. No, cannot do it. Okay, Homo erectus. Homo erectus is arguably one of the most significant and successful hominins to have ever lived, depending on how you define those terms. I have created a video on Homo erectus. It's like 42 minutes long. It's, I think, my longest video or my second longest video on the channel, not counting the live streams, of course, but it was a bitch to make and I'm still very proud of it and it completely flunked. People barely watched it, which was very sad. And I'm still sad by the fact that that happened and people didn't watch it. So yeah, please go watch that video. Thank you. All right, good talk, good talk. It is undoubtedly the longest surviving hominin with evidence showing the species lived between around 1.89 million and 1100. I can't speak. So between around 1.89 million and 110,000 years ago, that's almost 2 million years compared to modern humans that have only been around for 300,000 years, because the 200, nah, 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 we know the Jebeli root fossils are Homo sapiens, so this is just, I effing love science, this is a mistake in your article. We do not accept those mistakes. Humans, Homo sapiens, are at least 300,000 years old, we know this. So yeah, mm, let's go. Continue. Homo erectus is the first non-hominin to have migrated out of Africa. This feat gave the species a huge geographical distribution, with fossils showing the species spanned Africa, Asia, and Europe. In another first, there is some decent evidence that Homo erectus was also the first species to control fire. Really awesome. Remains of Homo erectus show it was a highly varied species, which isn't surprising considering its huge geographical and temporal extent. However, most specimens show signs of a human-like body, like elongated legs and shorter arms in comparison, in comparison to its torso. Then we have Homo antecessor, another species that I have created video on, and that video flunked, and Homo antecessor actually showed cannibalistic behavior. And I thought people would want to know more about that, and apparently they didn't because, like I said, my video on it completely flunked. History with Kaylee Homo Antecessor. 36,000 views. Isn't much. 
really isn't much. Also, Homo heidelbergensis did really well. And then we have Homo floresiensis, the hobbit species, super amazing hobbit species, like actual hobbits that have lived, that I will cover like in a moment on the article. 38,000 views. People, people, come on. Just watch my stuff on like ancient human species because they're awesome. They're really, really awesome. All right? All right. All right. Back to the article. Homo antecessor lived about 800,000 to 1.2 million years ago in Europe. This is very notable because this also goes to another article that I had saved. Um, this is an article from January 5th, 2024, as you can see here. Like, it's a new article, but the discovery itself isn't that new because we already knew about this for quite a while. These are the footprints at Hasbro in England. And these are the oldest modern human footprints of, uh, the, sorry, uh, the pff, modern human. These are the oldest footprints of a human species in Europe. Nearly a million years old, and they are from Homo antecessor, and they were in England back when Doggerland was still a thing. Doggerland, another thing I created a video on. England wasn't an island back then. England was connected to Europe, like mainland Europe. So yeah, really cool. Um, back to the article, back to the article. Otherwise we'll be here for like another five hours. So after first discovering their remains at the Grandolina cave in Spain in 1994, they were formally described as the last common ancestor of modern humans and Neanderthals. Later work showed that this wasn't exactly the case, although they are perhaps an offshoot of hominin that was formed just before the split between modern humans and Neanderthals. So maybe not the direct latest ancestor, but somewhere above there, still fine. It's fine. Homo antecessor, really cool species. Really want to learn more about them. Really hope that we can uncover more about them in the future. Then we have Homo heidelbergensis. I cannot say Homo heidelbergensis. I... Bergensis. I... It's just the Dutch G for y'all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Fossils show that Homo heidelbergensis lived approximately 700,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa, Europe, and possibly Asia. The species had a blend of features seen in both earlier hominins like Homo erectus and later species such as ourselves, Homo sapiens. Just as these features would suggest, they were a versatile and transitional hominin that wielded a relatively large brain could craft sophisticated tools, and inhabited diverse environments. Then next up we have Homo naledi, or Homo naledi, or the joke that I make, homeowner lady, because YouTube closed captions did not understand Homo naledi in my original Homo naledi video, and it created homeowner lady for the people using subtitles. So now we have the joke of Homo naledi being a homeowner lady. And that will definitely come on a t-shirt or a coaster or a mug or something like that. All right. One of the more recent additives to the gang, the remains of Homo Malady, were first discovered in 2013 by exploring the rising star cave system in the cradle of humankind in South Africa. Early work suggests that Homo Naledi lived millions of years ago owing to their relatively small brain size. However, subsequent dating revealed that they overlapped with Homo sapiens some 250,000 years ago. The species has become one of the most controversial characters in this cast of extinct humans, as detailed in a popular Netflix documentary, The Rising Star Cave System, that contains rock art and decorated graves, which some have said were created by Homo Naledi. The cave also suggests that species buried their dead, implying they had advanced emotional intelligence. This claim is remarkable since Homo naledi had brains not, not much bigger than that of a chimpanzee, so it's very remarkable. So remarkable, in fact, many paleoanthropologists don't buy it. This is a thing that I will eventually cover in a video. But yeah, I'm waiting for more information. Then we have Homo floresiensis, which I just 
mentioned, uh, is one of the most unique hominids, nicknamed the Hobbit. I am a massive big fan of Lord of the Rings, and we had actual hobbits living on the planet. I mean, that's awesome. The species stood at just over one meter, which is three feet and six inches tall, and had a teeny brain. <laughs> Don't let their small stature fool you into thinking that they were archaic, however. They lived on the Indonesian island of Flores just 100,000 to 50,000 years ago until modern humans arrived in the region. That means that there's a chance we came across this species in the flesh in the past. Uh, people like to speculate that they still exist. They don't. They really don't. The Indonesian islands aren't that big, so we would know if they still existed. Uh, some anthropologists have speculated that Homo floresiensis could still be living on the small Indonesian island based on the folk tales of the Indonesian indigenous Liao people. However, that's a pretty wild claim that not many other research like to entertain. Like I said, the island isn't that big. We would have known. Like, honestly, we we definitely would have known. Simple as that. Um, another sip sip for clean. So yeah. <laughs> Continue. <clears throat> Homo neanderthalensis. Or like I like to say Neanderthalensis because otherwise my brain wants to revert back to Dutch. Especially with my COVID brain, that isn't a good thing. So, better known as the Neanderthals. Homo Neanderthalensis is a bit like the sister species of Homo sapiens. Genetically, we are 99.7% identical. And it is starkly clear that rampant interbreeding occurred between the species time and time again. Not just once, not just twice, but time and time again. In years gone by, Neanderthals were often portrayed as heavy-browed, lumbering cavemen, cousin of Homo sapiens. However, mounting evidence shows that they were artistic, adaptable, and highly intelligent, which you will all see in my Homo Neanderthalensis documentary. Once I get to finishing it, probably in like two or three months, if we're going to be very, very honest and frank, because uh, COVID didn't help with my schedule. And I've got brand deals that need a video, which means that I need to work on quick in-between videos. And that makes me not able to work on the documentary. And I had hoped to release it early December. I'm not the best at planning a schedule. There's probably a reason why I'm my own boss. <laughs> But at the same time, it's also the worst being my own boss because I'm a terrible boss. I cannot hold a schedule. Sorry. Deepest, sincerest apologies for not having given you a Neanderthal documentary yet. Forgive me, please. <laughs> All right. So, and also for the people saying that my title is misleading, this is a new article that came out on January 19th that has to do with archaeology. Nothing misleading here. So, um, they died out, Neanderthals. They say 40,000 years ago in here. But that's wrong because we know that they still existed at the youngest at 32,000 years ago. Because we have remains found at 32,000 years ago. So. Neanderthals died out around 32,000 years ago for reasons that are hotly debated by scientists, which I also covered in a video. Some anthropologists believe it could be, have been climate change or disease outbreak that drove them into extinction. Others pin the blame on Homo sapiens for outcompeting them or introducing tropical diseases on their migration from Africa. And some even argue that the, the demise of Neanderthals could have been caused by a genocide at the hands of modern humans covered all that in a video. We also have, of course, Homo sapiens. We all know this. Uh, it's fine. Um, but yeah, this these are just the species that we currently know of. And I know that we have ghost species and that there are more. So I'm wondering, hopefully, we can learn more about them in the future. So uh, this was a new publication in Nature Anthropology. Have we been barking up the wrong ancestral tree? 
Australopithecines are probably not our ancestors. This is something I'm very interested in. This was published on December 15, 2023. It's a little older. I'm unsure if this is the case. Uh, I just wanted to mention this study real quick and I'm going to share this study in the chat with you guys so you can all go and check it out yourselves. Uh, it's in the chat right now. It will come up once it comes up. Um, but the thing is, this is a very, very extensive study, as you can see. Like, this is just the introduction I scrolled through here a little bit. And this is like point two. Um, I want to make a video on it in the future. I'm unsure if I will do a collaborative video on this with another anthropology channel on YouTube. So if you would like to see that, let me know in the chat, because then I know if you want to see me talking with another anthropology YouTuber about this. The idea that Australopithecines may not be our ancestors. So, yeah, really cool. Um, Share that article with you guys so you can watch it yourselves. And now we have this article. Really, I should prob. I, I really, 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 really need an app logger, but it's fine. University of Reading finds ancient traps and footprints in the Severn estuary. This was from January 6th, 2024. I checked this one. Like, I don't check everything, but I checked this one. New footprints found. Really cool. Um, footprints and ancient traps used for catching fish have been discovered in the Severn estuary. The Mesolithic discoveries were made possible thanks to excavations carried out by the University of Reading's archaeology department. The investigation is part funded by the National Geographic Society. Awesome. The team hopes the find will shed light on the lives of hunter-gatherers communities that lived in Britain more than seven millennia ago. The more than 7,000-year-old fishing traps are made from willow withies woven around wooden stakes. That's a sentence! Wow! Willow withies woven around wooden stakes. I'm proud of myself that I just... I did that one take. Perfect. To create a V-shaped fence in the bed of a former river channel. Experts from the university believe that they were probably used to catch eels and other fish. The fishing traps are made from willow with these woven around wooden stakes to create a V-shaped fence. Like here you can see, probably. This is probably what they meant. I don't see it, but that's fine. I'm not an archaeologist. Emeritus Professor Martin Bell of the University of Reading, who led the excavations, said the discovery is particularly important because within the channel containing the fish traps, low tides have revealed hundreds of footprints of people Animal, animals, and birds. Stormy conditions in September and October 2023 revealed the best exposures of the footprints for many years. Really, really cool. I like the Mesolithic. I really like the Mesolithic. The dig team had to work quickly to record as much as possible during the period of low spring tides before they became covered by the sea and encroaching sand. Mr. Bell hopes the footprints, which date back to a time before the arrival of farming, provide unique insights into the community that lived in Britain at that time. He added, many footprints belonged to children, some as young as four, showing that they played an active part in the daily life of Mesolithic communities. In places, lines of footprints moving in both directions mark footpaths leading from campsites at the island edge to the channel where the traps were located. The footprints show how individual camps and activity areas are connected as parts of a living landscape. Really awesome. Really cool. I like this. So I'm going to take a two minute break. Uh, I need to go to the bathroom, which is very normal for a woman. Uh, normally I was never able to do this. I just had to hold it in for like an entire two hours. 
Thankfully, now I don't. Uh, so I'll be back in a moment. And we're back. Awesome. So we can uh, go back to the articles. Sorry for that short break. I normally don't do that, but yeah, sometimes you know you have to. And uh, now that I can, I will. <laughs> so yeah, we are back. So next article. Archaeologists found 2,000-year-old hawk body. Really cool, in Northern Ireland. So let's read. So you can see the body right here on the picture up in the screen. Archaeologists from the Police Service of Northern Ireland have uncovered a 2,000 to 2,500 year old bog body in Northern Ireland. Authorities were alerted to human remains on the surface of peatland in Belagi, resulting in the archaeological unit within the police service of Northern Ireland's body recovery team being dispatched to conduct a forensic examination. Detective Inspector Nicky Dean said, on initial examination, we couldn't be sure if the remains were ancient or the result of a more recent death. Therefore, we proceeded to excavate the body with full forensic considerations in a sensitive and professional manner. This approach also ensures that any DNA evidence could be secured for any potential criminal investigation, which I personally find to be amazing. They take it seriously, which they should. A certified forensic anthropologist conducted a post-mortem examination, revealing that the individual was likely a male aged between 13 and 17 years old at the time of death. Although the cause of death remains unclear, the individual's remains are remarkably well Wow, are remarkably well preserved with partial skin, fingernails of the left hand, toenails, and possibly a kidney still intact. Okay, that's mind blowing. Like fingernails, toenails, a kidney, an intact kidney, two and a half thousand years old, possibly. Wow, <laughs> really cool. <clears throat> Radiocarbon dating conducted at the 14 Chrono Center 
part of Queen's, Queen's University, Belfast, has placed the year of death to around 500 BCE during the early Iron Age. Dr. Alastair Ruffel of Queen's University, Belfast, said, The remains were discovered at approximately one meter below the current land surface, which matches the radiocarbon estimates. In addition, they were amongst a cluster of fossil tree remains, suggesting that the body may have died or been buried in a copse of stand in a copse or stand of trees or washed in. Okay. John Joe O'Boyle, chief executive of Forest Service, said Forest Service recognizes the significance of this very exciting find. This ancient bog body was discovered on land owned by the department and we are now working with National Museums Northern Ireland to transfer it to them so that they can continue with further examination and preservation of the remains. Really, really cool. Like you can see here how seriously they took this excavation, which to me is like very awesome. Also for Pete's sake, exactly. For Pete's sake. <laughs> so yeah, that's really cool. <clears throat> I really like bog bodies. They are really strange and they aren't found often. So they're quite mysterious as well. But at the same time, they give us a whole lot more information than a cremated body or an inhumation that we found in a tomb somewhere. It's really cool. Next article. Somehow I'm getting like faster with the articles. What? 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 <clears throat> we shall see. Um, also for the people that have joined me just now, um, you may not know yet, but the first link in the description of this live stream is a direct link to a donation page. You can donate on that page to me and my work and it goes straight to my PayPal. So it doesn't go to YouTube where YouTube takes a cut or it doesn't go to Patreon where Patreon takes a cut, but it goes straight to me. So whatever you donate, no middleman, it goes straight to me, which is really awesome. And your name will be shown on screen, the name that you will give during the donation uh, process. And people in the chat and everyone watching this later can see that you have donated towards me and my work, which I think is really cool. So yeah, just wanted to say that for everyone who's just here. And if you subscribe to the channel, it will be seen on screen. If you do a super chat, as you can currently see, uh, that will be shown on screen as well. So, I mean, I'm trying my best, you know, like uh, me having COVID really wasn't fun. Me not being able to work for a complete month really wasn't fun. And uh, yeah, it's not great. So yeah. All right, back to the next uh, article. And uh, I just hope that the sound and like, everything, video and sound is still good, because if so, then this is really the first stream where nothing went wrong besides me reading an article that's like two years old. <laughs> that was fun. I am blonde. <laughs> well, it's fine. All right, next article. Researchers find evidence of an advanced material culture 45,000 years ago. Date from January 20. 2024, yay! At least it's still not an article from two years ago. <laughs> I keep thinking about that. Like for the first time, nothing went wrong and still I made it happen. So yeah, really cool. Um, Let's go. A multinational team of researchers have published a new paper in the Journal of Nature, Ecology and Evolution, presenting findings that indicate the existence of an advanced material culture in China around 40, 45,000 years ago. The paper centers on Xiu Upper Paleolithic site in Shangxi province, where previous archaeological excavations during the 1960s uncovered evidence of human occupation in the lower context layers. Among the discoveries were more than 15,000 stone tools, numerous animal remains, and a fragment of a hominid skull. 
identified as belonging to the Homo sapiens species. Part of this archaeological assemblage was relocated to the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing. However, the remaining materials, including the cranial fragment, were lost when left in local facilities. How dare they? Like, that's such a shame. Under the direction of Dr. Zhizha Yang, the researchers examined the remaining assemblage by using modern radiometric techniques that enabled them to accurately establish the chronological timeline. The results of their study revealed that the cultural layer at Xiu dates to a period between 45,800 and 43,200 years ago. According to the study authors, the finding provides new information to understand the expansion of Homo sapiens on the Asian continent and the arrival of the first modern humans in northern China. In addition, the type of material culture that first settlers utilized. According to Professor Yang, this is an early Upper Paleolithic assemblage, which includes laminar technology, but also Levallois points, projectile points, with evidence of handling and impact fractures, tools made with obsidian from hundreds of kilometers of distance, projectile points made of animal bone, as well as small perforated graphite disc. The material culture indicates that these early settlers had a capacity to supply themselves with resources from large distances and use a cultural hybridization of materials to gain a technological advantage. Really cool article. So, Homo sapiens back in China. Really, we're better than we thought. So, yeah. That's... Uh, the articles that I had selected for you guys, I really thought that I would be here for like at least two hours and it was okay. I did a bit faster. It was like within 1.5 hours and I even took a pee break of like nearly two minutes, I think, <laughs> which is fine. So I think that this is it. This was my live stream. New archaeological excavations of the past month, including one article from two years ago that I actually created a video on already. <laughs> Still, again, so sorry. <laughs> so, really, um, yeah, first live stream with my new webcam and with a built-in mic so that I really couldn't mess up the audio anymore, I think. Um, I think it went well. I hope all y'all enjoyed all of this. If you have some questions for me, leave them in the chat. Sorry, moderators, you might need to like heavily moderate <laughs> in the next moments. But yeah, leave your question for me in the chat and I'll see if I can answer them. And uh, yeah, this was really fun. I enjoyed this. This was cool. Also, I really, really like the way that this all looks from Streamlabs. Like if the stream starts in the future, it looks like this. Like stream is starting. How cool is that? And if the stream is going to end soon, it's going to look like stream is ending. Awesome. Like, and when I had my pee break, I had my be right back screen. <laughs> and if I'm going offline, then it's going to be this. But this is mostly for Twitch, I think. But yeah, maybe I'm going to stream to Twitch as well. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to stream to Twitch as well. Yeah, I don't have Twitch followers at all. So maybe I will diversify the streams. So not my videos. My videos will still only be found on YouTube, but maybe I will diversify my streams also to Twitch. So um, yeah, could be. And uh, yeah, uh, I haven't really seen any questions after I asked, but yeah, it's fine. <laughs> People don't have anything to ask of me, apparently, about my work, of course, like, uh, waiting for home on the lady video to correct your old one. Well, as I said just now when reading the article about half an hour ago, I think, um, I want to create another video on home on the lady and go over all the new information and correct things. But the problem is that I need more information and that information hasn't become available yet. So I can't make a video on that and correct things if I don't have the correct new information. 
just waiting on everything. Like there are rebuttals, uh, rebuttal papers being written. There are uh, a lot of question marks surrounding some of the things that were found in the, the in the publication of last year. So until then, we will see. I can dual stream. I could dual stream to Twitch and YouTube, I think. At least Streamlabs said I could. We'll see. <laughs> so yeah, we can see. Um, do we have any other things? Uh, mm, <laughs> let's see, let's see, let's see. Nobody have questions. Why? How? What? I tried to donate on PayPal. It's not allowing you to. I don't know why. When will History with Kaylee be live on Twitch? Probably at the same time I'm live on YouTube, so you can either pick which is your preferred thing to use it. Do you do I have a video on bog bodies? I do not actually. Huh. Probably has to do with the I don't know. Hmm. I don't know why. Why don't I have a video on bog bodies? I should probably make one in the um future. Have you considered doing a collab with Gutsy Gibbon? Could be fun. Yes, I've actually spoken to her. We are both currently very busy, which is not fun, but we have decided to do a collaboration in the future, in the very near future, so we will keep in contact and see when both of us have time. Any group tours in 2024? No group tours this year. Maybe next year. Who knows? We will see. <laughs> are hobbits the same as pygmies? I'm, yeah, it's possible that the hobbit species was the same as like a pygmy species. There were pygmy elephants, if I remember correctly, on Flores as well. So, yeah, could be. Did you say civilization 40,000 years ago or advanced community? No, 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 no. Advanced material culture 45,000 years ago. So, as you can see here, advanced Material culture, 45,000 years ago. Not the same as a civilization. A civilization is just a completely different thing. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? What do we have? Uh, if you are paying for Streamlabs, then yes, you can dual stream. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I've decided that if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this correctly. So, yeah, I've decided to pay for Streamlabs, so I should be able to dual stream. Should be able. Uh, a video on human tooth evolution would be good. Uh, Robert Bench, are you a dentist by any chance? Because I, I don't, I, I, I never thought that average people would have an interest in ancient teeth and tooth evolution. <laughs> Just wondering, like, no shame, no shame. If you're a dentist, I, I love your work. I just don't want to sit in your chair and have my teeth hurt. Okay, okay. Uh, what was my, what was the cause of your fascination of collection of history? Um, I've been interested in history for as long as I can remember. I've always wanted to know where we come from. And yeah, it's, it's, <sighs> I, I can't remember where it originated. I just know that as a young girl, I used to go through the pages of encyclopedias in my mom's house and just read as much as I could on ancient things. So yeah, like five, six, seven years old. Uh, Mark Beignet, thank you so much for your <laughs> super chat. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy that you enjoy my videos. Uh, could I do a video just on hobbits? I did a video on Homo floresiensis, which was the hobbit species. Um, the Lord of the Rings Hobbits by Tolkien, I can't make a video on because that's not history or ancient history. And the rest of my work doesn't really fit. What's my next favorite? What's your next favorite me topic next to archaeology? I like everything in the world. I think. <laughs> uh, thoughts on the two distinct peoples who were wiped out in Denmark's past? I've read a little bit about this, but I, I, 
it, it was in the middle of me having COVID, I think, because it's just a fog here. I don't remember exactly what I read. Uh, who influenced me to be a part of YouTube? Honestly, the first influence was definitely Jenna Marbles. Definitely Jenna Marbles. Yeah, don't know why, can't explain. She was just amazing and I loved her and she was so relatable and that's all I wanted to do as well. But then I decided to want to teach people things. <laughs> And then I made my life really hard because now I have to like actually put in work instead of just sitting in front of a camera and having fun. <laughs> um, Robert Bench, he's not a dentist. Okay, okay. But it, it is indeed an unusual subject. I just had to make a joke in there. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Let's see. Did I ever fall for any of the alien theories when we when I was young? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I watched Ancient Aliens when I was, what, nine? It was really cool. Duh. <laughs> and then I grew up and I stopped believing in fairy tales. So yeah. Um, let's see. Anything else? Anything else? Uh, I don't know if Egyptians had tooth problems due to the way they grounded their flower. No. No, no idea. Uh, In-depth history about the evolution and fascination of the potato. I mean, I do love myself good potato, but <laughs> maybe that's a little bit too niche. So sorry. Um, all right, I think that's it. So I uh, am going to end the stream here. I think it's probably a little bit shorter than I have streamed in the past, but that's fine, that's fine. Uh, this happens, this was the first time doing this, and it's all, also really, really late. It's uh, past 10.30 in the evening here in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, I should probably get to sleep soon because I need to go to the gym tomorrow, early. So yeah, thank you so much for the uh, super chats and your presence here in the chat. I really enjoyed it, thank you. And I have a new video coming this weekend. It's uh, really cool. So I hope you're going to enjoy it and I hope you'll all be there to watch it. And thank you for having joined me today. And please forgive me for reading out an article from two years ago that I already made a video on. <laughs> Really can't get over that. And uh, thank you to all my moderators and everyone supporting me. And I will see you next time. So, oh, on the flip side, like, Ricker, thank you so much for that super chat. Like, woof, you were just in time. I had almost clicked away. Have I ever considered doing a long Viking river cruise as a lecturer on the Danube from Denmark to Vienna's Roman excavations? I have not because I'm not really that well versed in the Vikings and my work usually goes to like the more ancient, ancient stuff. And Vikings are quite young compared to that. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you so much for the super chat. Really, really kind of you. Thank you. And uh, I will see you next time. And uh, have a great night. Bye guys. <laughs>